I'm Dakota McFadden, and you're listening to the True North Country Comics Podcast. Welcome to the True North Country Comics Podcast, dedicated to promote Canadian comic book creators and supporters. It's October 29th, 2020. I'm John Swinimer. If you have a comment, criticism, or question, you can contact me at john at truenorthcountrycomics.com. On this episode, I chat with Dakota McFadson. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel. Dakota is a Canadian cartoonist who's been published by Mad Magazine, The New Yorker, The Best American Comics, and Funny or Die. He's also worked as a storyboard artist for DreamWorks. McFadden is an alumni of the Center for Cartoon Studies. He previously has two books available from Conundrum Press, Other Stories and The Horse He Rode In On, and Don't Get Eaten By Anything, which collects three years of daily comic strips. He is a co-editor and co-founder of the comics and art anthology Irene, and distributes his own short stories in his ongoing mini-comic series Last Mountain. His newest book is entitled To Know You're Alive from Conundrum Press, described as a brilliantly dark collection that offers a glimpse into the cracks between childhood imagination and the disappointing harshness of adulthood. So, without further ado, here's my chat with Dakota McFadson. So, Dakota McFadson, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. Thank you. I appreciate your time. What I normally do to start off the interview is ask a creator about their first comic book. So, I'm wondering if you remember, what was the first comic book that you read? The first comic book I remember holding in my hands and flipping through was before I could read, and it was uh, like a Casper the Friendly Ghost digest from the grocery store. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think I was reading it backwards because at four years old, I thought the barcode meant that that was the front of the book for some reason, so I started at the back and read backwards. Oh, okay, like a manga. Yeah, exactly. But it it was a lot of like just whatever comics you could buy at a grocery store. So a lot of Archie Digests, Casper the Friendly Ghost, Richie Rich, that kind of thing. And then later it it was also a lot of Calvin and Hobbes and Peanuts and things like that. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm wondering who or what inspires you to create today? I mean, that can vary depending on the day. I mean, there are certain certainly cartoonists I admire and look up to. Chris Ware was sort of a, a big influence as I was sort of rediscovering comics as an adult and sort of seeing that it you know uh how much the medium had had changed um i had kind of moved away from comics a little bit when i was in high school i never really got super deep into superhero stuff or anything and i was still drawing a lot in high school but yeah so chris ware was probably a big one linda berry and the way she writes about writing it's something that i often need to return to when i'm stuck or feeling otherwise hopeless with a project i'm working on i find that her stuff always sort of reminds me about the the simple pleasure of just making something and creating so definitely her yeah and and then you know i'm friends with a lot of cartoonists of course so like seeing my friends working really hard uh sort of puts the fire under me to do the same Great. Good stuff. No, we're talking because I understand you have a new book coming out called To Know You're Alive. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that book. Sure. So To Know You're Alive is a collection of short comics that I had worked on over the last seven years or so, and they kind of accumulated as they tend to do. They've appeared in various forms, most of them as like self-published mini comics, but also in other folks' anthologies and magazines and, and what have you. Originally, a few years ago, my publisher, Andy Brown of Conundrum Press, and I were talking about future projects we might want to turn into a book. And I had a lot of stories building up that were set in childhood or about children in one way or another. So, you know, we both thought, okay, well, that's that's the next book is do a whole bunch of stories about children and that'll be the book. And sort of Partway through that, I ended up having kids of my own, and there was sort of this shift in my work where suddenly more of the stories were from an adult perspective, often still about kids, but more from a parent's perspective, and and sometimes not about kids at all. There's a number of stories in here that are just sort of about more day-to-day adult concerns. And so the book is not quite perfectly, but divided in half between stories that are set in childhood and are about childhood or about memory in some way, and then stories that are more about adulthood and and fears and responsibilities that come with that. 
Oh, okay, because I was going to ask if it was uh, the the way it was sounding there for a bit that it might have been written for children, but I I presume you've moved it completely in that direction of being a, an adult type of story. Yeah, most most of my work is not safe for kids. Oh, well, I don't know. I, I saw some weird stuff when I was a kid too. So <laughs> I guess it depends on the kid. Yeah, a, a lot of my stories tend to be kind of cute and horrifying at the same time. My work gets called horror a lot, although I don't think I've done like a straight up horror story yet. I would like to at some point. But it's a lot of sort of existential and cosmic fears sort of woven into that. I, I felt a lot of that when I was a kid and was really fascinated by uh, sort of big, almost Lovecraftian concepts of, of uh. what the scale of the universe was. Mm-hmm. And so that that shows up in the work a little bit. But there's also sort of non-magical stories as well that are sort of reflections on kids I would have went to school with or, you know, kids who were picked on and, and attempting to make friends with them. And so that sort of comes into the stories as well. Okay, great. I wonder if we could uh, step back a little bit and talk about your creative sure. process. If you could walk me through how you go from the initial concept to the finished page. Uh, sure. Well, that can vary a lot too, although I tend towards being somewhat improvisational and spontaneous. When I'm working on a longer thing, I tend to map it out a little bit more. But uh, something you may or may not know about me is I, I did a daily comic strip for six years that I just posted on my website. It was uh, Some of the comics were also published by Conundrum Press. And so uh, approaching those strips, I got very comfortable with, with sort of starting with an image or an idea and then trying to resolve it by the fourth panel. And even when I work on short stories, that's often how I will approach it. I'll have a, an idea for an image I want to explore or a type of character I want to explore or an ending that I want to do, or a beginning I want to do, and I sort of work my way through it that way. I will thumbnail things very loosely in my sketchbook, even if it's just stick figures, but the part that's interesting to me is drawing on the page, and so I tend to try to get to that part as quickly as possible, which uh, sometimes blows up in my face when I paint myself into a corner and realize I have to scrap what I'm doing and start again. But for the most part, that's where the real excitement of making comics is. It's just jumping into the penciling and then the inking. And my process is also, for the most part, fairly traditional tools and materials still. I I prefer to work on paper with a nib and ink. And unless I'm really strapped for time, uh, I don't tend to draw digitally most of the time. Uh, But I do rely on a computer for coloring and cleanup and things like that. Okay. I, I just want to go back and, and check on something. You you mentioned sure. how you had done web comics and you were limiting to four panels. And I know in talking to others, that can be either very limiting or, or freeing uh, because you have to be very concise and precise in, in the story you're trying to tell. So I'm wondering, is your preference always to have a specified limited number of panels when you're trying to do a story? No, sometimes I'll set a grid and adhere to it. And there's certainly a few stories in the book where you can see I I use grids differently, where like if it's a childhood flashback, I'll use a lot of tiny panels in a grid. And then when it's adulthood in the present, it'll just be like a straight six panel grid with no variation in it. But yeah, it really depends. I mean, a constraint can be freeing in a way. Something about the constraint of four panels means that it has its own rhythm and beat to it, and you know that whatever happens, you have to resolve it somehow by the fourth panel. But there's also a spread in the book that's part of a project I, I started years ago that I called the Pasqua Penny Saver, where I would do these two-sided photocopied pages of strips that were just like tiny postage stamp-sized panels. And then I would photocopy a whole bunch of them and just leave them in cafes for free for people to grab. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I did another one of these recently. I revisited the project for uh, Tattle Creek magazine, and I was happy with how it turned out. So we sort of use it as the intermission in the book, dividing the childhood stories from the adulthood stories. And it's just like tons of teeny tiny postage stamp size panels meandering into each other. And some of the strips actually intersect and affect one another. And, you know, it's it's kind of just a fun formal challenge to like lay out a grid on a page and see how much stuff I can cram into it. I really enjoy doing that. It just takes forever. I was looking at your background. Notice you've done storyboards. So I'm wondering if you have a preference between doing that and comic books. Uh, Well, it depends in what sense. Like I find storyboarding really fun because I get to work with other people. And I've been very lucky to work with people who I find to be very talented and very funny 
And there can be a little bit of a, when you're doing a board driven show, for example, where there's no script, it can feel a little bit like a writer's room where, where you and your partner are kind of one upping one another and, and working the jokes until they're more or less perfect and challenging one another to do better. But I'm also, you know, because I'm a cartoonist, I'm also something of a control freak. So I also enjoy working alone on my comics and not being interrupted, not having any notes or anything, just being able to do exactly what I want for good or bad. I will say that storyboarding pays a lot better, <laughs> Right. but comics can, I, I find comics to be a little bit more creatively fulfilling mm. uh, simply because you, your successes and failures are your own to have. And I don't know if that's appealing to me for whatever reason. Okay, cool. Now we've talked about to know your life. So I'm wondering if you have any other projects in the works that you can talk about. Yeah, I've been chipping away for a few years at a at a longer comic, like a graphic novel, which was actually supposed to come out in place of this book, but was delayed for a number of reasons, one of which is that I had a second child, which slows the cartooning process down quite a bit. But the story of that, if I ever finish it, which I hope to, is it's about an aging paranormal investigator who has been like studying the paranormal his whole life and has never found any solid evidence for ghosts or anything like that. And as he's in his old age now, he's starting to like, you know, sort of have like an existential crisis about that. And he really wants to just find solid evidence of, of ghosts before he dies. And, and so it's sort of, it's a bit of a dark comedy. It, it follows his stresses of trying to find proof of the paranormal and his increasingly desperate attempts to do so. Well, it sounds very intriguing, that's for sure. So I'm wondering where people can find out about this forthcoming project and your, your existing work online, maybe social media or website? I have a website that acts more as a portfolio, which I don't update that often. It's dakota-mcfadzen.com. But I'm fairly active on Twitter and Instagram. Both of my accounts, I believe, are just at Dakota McFadden, all one word. Yeah, I, I post a lot of sketches and works in progress and finished strips and, you know, spontaneous sketchbook strips on there. So there's, there's always something new coming in. Thanks to Dakota for the chat. You can discover more about Dakota on Twitter at Dakota McFadson and online at Dakota-McFadson.com. Discover more about To Know You're Alive, please visit Conundrum Press at ConundrumPress.com. And thanks to you for listening to the True North Country Comics podcast. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to and like this podcast on Apple Podcasts. And please leave a good rating. Also check out the TrueNorthCountryComics.com website and follow along on Twitter at TrueNorthComics. True North Country Comics is now on YouTube, so please like and subscribe to that video channel. Please send your feedback to John at TrueNorthCountryComics.com. Thanks again for listening, and come back soon for another episode. Bye for now. True North Country Comics podcast is copyright True North Country Comics, copyright 2020.